thank you everybody for, for coming. Um, welcome to our second workshop of the series where we'll talk about equity and inclusion in a global Jesuit context. Uh, uh, just want to also prepare prepare us all for, for this uh, session today. If, if anybody has any questions or comments or, or things that they would like, uh, we'll have some time at the end, but I would definitely encourage you to, to just go ahead and type that into the chat if you want to get that thought out. Um, we'll definitely address it um, in either within that, that time allotted uh, towards the end, or we can also just start to incorporate some of that feedback right away. So definitely encourage you to use that chat function um, to engage with us uh, during this presentation. But, uh, so maybe just to start off, um, um, my name is Taiga Guterres, uh, and I'm the Assistant Director of the Institute for Advanced Jesuit Studies here at Boston College. Uh, and I'm honored to be here today with you all. Uh, and I'm also here with my colleague. Uh, and, and I'll let Charlie uh, introduce himself before we get into the agenda. Thank you so much, Taiga. Um, Charlie County, I direct our Catholic teacher formation and I'm the co-director of our MED in Jesuit Education and Global World in the Lynch School of Education. And I also direct our Urban Catholic Teacher Corps. I'm excited to be here with you all this evening. And I wanna thank my uh, colleague, uh, Taiga, for uh, being on with me this evening. And I also want to uh, thank our colleagues with JSN, Catherine Steffens and Tim Sasson, who helped us in organizing and planning uh, for these events and this series of events and hopefully some future ones as well. And I'll pass it back to my colleague. Awesome. So today uh, we're going to go into our, our agenda for today is to really talk about uh, equity and inclusion, um, kind of what that means. Uh, you know, I think within our context, I think these words are are becoming kind of buzzwords, but also I think we're just really talking about it more, which is I think a really great focus for all of us uh, with all the you know recent events that. Um, have been impacting not only our, our schools and institutions, but our students and families. I think, uh, you know, kind of recentering ourselves and really trying to get into those nuances of equity and inclusion and what they really mean for us um, is, is really important. And so uh, we'll, we'll kind of go into uh, some of that. Uh, we'll also be talking about from a Catholic and Jesuit um, perspective, um, the call to equity and inclusion um, and, and the UAPs. We'll also be talking about global citizenship kind of that, that role, uh, that, that position that we play uh, within all of that. And then hopefully, you know, really trying to make it concrete um, for us, you know, what does it mean for us as, as educators within working within these Jesuit schools um, and, and then open it up to conversations and questions. So we'll, we'll jump right in, um, in the uh, work of equity, of diversity, inclusion. Oftentimes we see and hear those terms thrown in together, sometimes even abbreviated as DEI, diversity, equity, and inclusion. Um, and in some sectors and at times we've seen those uh, terms being used interchangeably when in fact they mean very, very different things. Uh, so we'll start with this idea of diversity versus inclusion, not that they are uh, dichotomies from each other, um, but when we talk about diversity, we're talking about who is in the room, who is there with us. And as we count heads, as we look around the room, we're taking account of who is actually physically there. This does not speak to who has a voice in the room, who has power in the room, who has privilege. It just speaks to who is present. When we get into inclusion, we then begin to consider and think about who, whose voice matters within the space. When we have individuals within our schools, are we not only counting who is there and present in the school, but including all voices, making sure that all cultures matter, that we are creating space and place for all people. It is so very important as you sit down in your schools and your classrooms to plan that you think about these ideas, this idea of who is present, but then also who is being heard, who is speaking, whose culture, whose history, whose background is being rolled up and engaged in this planning, this teaching, this learning, this formative process. We would ask you at this time um, to type in, if you feel comfortable with it, into either the chat box or the question box, um, the type uh, or whether you think that your institution tends to focus more on diversity or inclusion, or you could simply say both. All 
All right, thank you for those responses. And so we do see that it tends towards diversity at this time, though we also acknowledge that this is a work that is incomplete. We are on that road, if you will. We are engaging in this work and this work is laying a foundation. I'm gonna to move to talking a little bit more about this idea of equity. Individuals oftentimes fall into thinking about equity in similar terms to equality. This image, I like it, and uh, a colleague uh, in the Lynch School shared it with me a number of years ago now, uh, and said, this is a good way to think about it. If we give everyone, no matter, and this is a very simplistic idea here, but if we're all trying to see a baseball game over a fence and we provide everyone with the exact same support to do so, in this case, in this image, one box, if you will, then they all are being given the same thing, which in some ways is a good. This is not something that is or should be seen as a bad in any way, but it isn't something that we're striving for, and especially if we are talking and thinking about Catholic social teaching. If we're thinking about Catholic social teaching, if we're thinking about the dignity of every learner, if we're thinking about serving on the margins, then we should be considering this idea of equity, providing individuals what they need. And so then you see the transfer of those boxes and the tallest individual doesn't need one. They have that height but the shortest does gain from it. And so then in that idea of equity, though that one of the individuals pictured is given nothing, they're simply there and have the opportunity to engage and see the game, to participate in that way. Now, the individual in this picture that's the shortest has an opportunity to get the same thing or something very similar to the individual in this case that has the height. This of course, um, is an image is meant to be a cartoon and simply get us thinking about this idea. Um, however, you also see pictured here is this idea of reality of those with the most are often given the most. Individuals that, um, this is the same idea of that uh, term we think of and we talk about of individuals uh, being born on third base, if you will. They oftentimes have a lead and then they're given even more. They're given great education, great resources, uh, plenty of food to eat, shelter, clothing. Their wants, needs are met, and that's oftentimes the reality. And then we have this group that gets enough so that they can participate. And then we have this individual that are born with less material, less ability to meet their needs, and we oftentimes dig a hole for them and leave them behind. And that's the reality. And that's what we need to, if we are truly to engage in DEI work, diversity, equity, inclusion work, if we are to truly engage in Jesuit education that includes and welcomes all people, then we are seeking justice. And this justice and the sense of justice, social justice, here I'm speaking about, is working against this reality. So how do we privilege those individuals that enter into our educational institutions having had less opportunity? How are we welcoming them? How are we making this education available to them at all? And when they come to the table, how are we making sure that they understand that they are valued and they are known and they are loved within our community? And, and so when we talk about inclusion, uh, I think we're also inherently talking about exclusion. And, and so before I bring in, maybe we get into those questions of, of analysis and how do we kind of approach, um, you know, kind of do a social diagnosis of what's going on. I kind of wanted to take a step back and, and ask, you know, how, how are we approaching the questions and, and to bring in the uh, what's called the person and environment perspective, which some of you may already be familiar with, but um, just, you know, within this process, we recognize that a person interacts with the environment and that the environment interacts with the person. And so, you know, both of those factors being uh, affecting one another. And so within this imaginative exercise, you know, we could imagine that someone who's in a wheelchair for whatever reason, um, you know, they could be in a, in a situation where they arrive at a school and in order to get to the student services office, there's only stairs, right? And, and that services um, for them is on that second floor. And so uh, within this, I think there's this, not only this question of being able to incorporate both the person and the environment, but
But also there comes the question of who, who do we start with when we look to name the problem? Do we start with the person um, and say, you know, th this person is disabled and we kind of need to, to start with them? Um, or do we start with the environment and kind of say that the environment is disabling um, for this person? And so uh, not only, you know, in that sense of naming the problem, but then we can also ask ourselves, who do we start with when we look to solve the problem, when we look towards solutions? And so, uh, Charlie, if you could just click that one. Yep, thanks. Um, you know, we could start with the person, right? Kind of that person-centered approach. How do we get that person up there, up to that service? You know, maybe it's to help them adapt to the environment. And we might also think of this as equipping people with tools. Uh, we might also see this as an empowerment approach or providing accommodations. But then the other way to maybe look at it as well is how do we get that service down here? or at least so that there's as little difference in the amount of time, effort, and resources needed for those in different situations. So, so both in that sense of, you know, when we're naming the problem, but also when we're looking towards solutions, within that person and environment perspective, there's uh, not just the incorporation of both, because I think within both of those, we're incorporating, you know, that sense of both that person and, and how they interact with the environment. But, you know, those solutions can have very different impacts. And sometimes not all solutions are practical. I think uh, that's definitely something to consider. Um, you know, financially, those those two different solutions might have very, very different um, impacts and amount of resources. But I think it's worth considering how creative we might get when we consider where we start in both naming the problem and where we start in looking for the solution. And so I think as leaders, you know, in many ways, we act as the connector between the person and the environment. Uh, I like to imagine that we're, we're like that word in uh, holding both the person and the environment together. And so kind of with that in mind, we have these questions, um, you know, to kind of inform maybe the disposition, this lens through which we analyze the situation. And so we might consider some questions as it comes to inclusion and exclusion. So this first one, you know, who or what is excluded? You know, who's not getting their basic needs met? Who do we start with? And I, I really draw from the Jesuit John Sabrino here when he says that we always, we start with the marginalized. Another question that we uh, might consider is who or what is excluding them? When we're looking to diagnose exclusion, with whom do we start? And we have to be careful here, I think, you know, that in the act of diagnosing that sense of exclusion or who or what is doing that, um, that, you know, that we're not demonizing the other as another Jesuit Father Greg Boyle says. And then we separate the person from the problem. And however much, you know, those two things might be intertwined. Uh, Sabrina, to bring him again, uh, would say that we condemn the sin and we walk on the sinner. That it's never about a punitive justice, but a restorative one. That in the end, it's about restoring a right relationship. And sometimes one of the biggest impacts on a person is the environment. And so kind of that leads into this third question of, you know, what are the impacts of exclusion? Jesuits like John Sabrino or, or the bishops of Latin America speak of starting with the effects rather than the causes. And, and maybe in some other ways, we might've heard this language being implemented you know, in that sense of starting with the impact before we start with the intention. And you know, we do this, Sabrino says, because of compassion, because there's an urgency to this. And so then leading into the next question, you know, how do we know? How do we know and how do we gather the right type of data do we have enough information? What kind of information are we missing? Uh, what kind of information do we privilege, right? Do we privilege uh, testimony in the same way that we privilege maybe data or um, different types of data? Or who is the testimony coming from? Is it coming from a student or a parent or a teacher? You know, whose information do we privilege and, and how is it documented? And then finally, I think something to also consider is, is you know, are there things that should be excluded? Uh, or why, when might it be just to exclude something? And, you know, are there things that really do not have a place in our environments? Um, you know, things that should not be welcome. And so I think sometimes, you know, uh, not to um, outright say that, you know, everything must be a, a work of inclusion, but to really also at the same time have a commitment to, to figure out, you know, maybe that nuance there and, and how do we really create create an environment that sometimes exclusion for a specific type of behavior or, or of hate speech, for example, um, that really might provide 
the safety needed um, for the work of inclusion. And this and, brings us to yeah, fine. my apologies, Tiger. No, 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 please. <laughs> I was just going to simply note this brings us to um, the words and the wisdom of uh, Pope Francis, but I'm going to turn it over to my colleague to lead us through that. Uh, yeah, so I think, uh, you know, Charlie and I, when we were uh, chatting about, you know, this topic, um, you know, the, the words of Pope Francis' uh, most recent encyclical, Fratelli Tutti, came to, came to our minds. Um, and so, you know, this, this was released just this last October. Um, but he, he talks about, you know, that the sense that human rights in practice are really not equal for all. And, and respecting those rights is the preliminary condition. So, again, kind of looking at that social environment. You know, the, the respect for those rights as a preliminary condition for a country's social and economic development. That when the dignity of the human person is respected, his or her rights recognized and guaranteed, that's when we have this creativity and interdependence that thrives and the creative, creativity of the human personality um, working towards that common good. So I, I don't know, I, I think both of us here were, were, were really kind of inspired by um, you know, the, the work of, of Pope Francis, but also how he really starts to connect, you know, the inequalities with the social environments, but also that person, you know, in that context. And so, um, you know, as, as leaders, I think we work with the system, with the system and, and in many ways as the system, and, and that we work as part of the institution with which our students learn. And so, uh, you know, I just wanted to offer two possible ways to think of that relationship that stems from the Catholic tradition. And so I'm drawing here from, from uh, peace, justice, and reconciliation literature, uh, but two approaches to see our work from the perspective of covenant and contract. So in a contract, uh, you know, there's this tendency to be more performance oriented, that there are marked minimum commitments that we are agreeing to, um, or that there's certain standards to be upheld and when these commitments are broken, uh, you know, the contract can be seen as broken or void. Whereas uh, from a covenant and a covenantal perspective, you know, there's a tendency to be more relationship oriented. It's, it's marked by uh, both a sense of belonging and autonomy. autonomy uh, and it's really kind of based on moral commitment rather than mutual utility. And so in that sense of the covenant, you know, we might have conflict or, or hurt one another, um, but the covenant remains. And so that, that sense that, you know, there's always kind of this, this pulling towards the more or the majus um, that we'll talk about later. And, and I think in some ways it's important to also say contracts are helpful, you know, uh, and necessary even. It, it can provide a sense of security in a lot of ways for somebody. It can provide a sense of accountability and expectation but I think, you know, just to propose, I think that as leaders in Jesuit institutions, we're called to provide our students and our colleagues with more than just a contractual relationship, but to enter into that covenantal one. Which brings us directly into this idea as Taiga began to note of what is it, what is the basis of the agreement with Jesuit schools and with their students? The contract is of course, high quality education, that seeks excellence in the classroom and outside of the classroom, uh, an education that seeks to care for the whole person. But then there's this idea of a covenant, of forming global citizens. And this idea of formation, forming people of faith. Pope Francis in talking about the UAPs said that the first, this idea of showing the way to God is essential for any of the others to follow. If in the Jesuit schools, we're about forming individuals, we need to show the way to God. And then these other ideas and the other UAPs speak to ways in which individuals can enter into deeper relationship with God and to deeper relation with a global citizenry. When we ask our students to walk on the margins, to walk with the excluded, to walk with the poor, whether that be in opportunities uh, near or right next door, there is great need throughout our community. The poor individuals whose dignity has been questioned in our society, whose voices have been excluded, we need to find ways to reconcile 
these individuals within our society, to help them to seek justice, to help their voices be heard. These are all doorways for our students to see God more deeply. When the UAPs talk about journeying with the youth, it is journeying with the youth to create a better world, to endow them with a hope that we can be better, we can do better. Our society can serve all people. It can't just be about those that have and those that have not. How do we all have together? How do we be in relationship and how do we fulfill within Jesuit education this covenant to create global citizens, to form individuals of faith that look beyond themselves, that look to a greater good, that look to see, serve God's great glory? When we think about caring for our common home, if we can have students that graduate that aren't just seeking greater pay, but greater good, individuals that are seeking to care for our whole world for themselves, for their children, their children's children, and for their neighbor's children. It cannot just be about us against them. How do we come together? How do we create a world that God would recognize here on earth. This is our call. We have this opportunity through reflection with the UAPs to deepen our call and to see through the UAPs, through the window they offer, the lens they offer to a view of the world that calls us all to be in greater communion with one another. This tremendous window for reflection on this covenant with which our Jesuit schools have made with their students. This great promise to form these individuals who will go forth and serve the greater glory of God on this earth. The Society and the Secretariat of Education have defined, and you all have probably gotten very used to this uh, definition of global citizens, those who continuously seek to deepen their awareness of their place and responsibility, both locally and globally in an increasingly interconnected world. An increasingly interconnected world. Those who stand in solidarity with others in the pursuit of a sustainable earth and a more humane world as true companions in the mission of reconciliation and justice. Our covenant is this agreement to create, to form individuals that look beyond themselves to how they can serve God and their fellow man. How they can love one another as God has loved them. This is our great covenant within Jesuit education. This is this idea of magis, of more. We can't settle just with an excellent academic education. We can't settle with excellence in athletics. We have to seek to do more for our students and in that way for our global community as well as our local community. And so, you know, maybe to take those earlier questions proposed for the social analysis, but not to kind of tweak them a bit, you know, put them in the context of the formation of global citizens. You know, we might consider some of these questions as well, and hopefully to bring these back and have conversations around these. But you know, to to ask how am I doing in supporting the formation of global citizens, but also you know how is my school doing in forming global citizens? And I think that interplay, right, to bring back that person and environment perspective, that that recognition that you know how does how does my school and their work affect how I'm doing, and how's I'm how is what I'm doing affecting the school? But also, you know, that sense of how, how do I know? You know, how do we interrogate the data that we privilege and, and why? Why is that part of maybe the culture of my specific school or, or the larger school environment? How is my school community reflecting on our formation of global citizens? And, and are they? And, and in what ways, you know, is it um, more of a sidelines conversation? Is it part of what we do? And, and how is it kind of structured into, um, 
you know, the way in which we work, uh, but then also the way in which we, we reflect on our work. And I realize, you know, for, I think for a lot of institutions, uh, sometimes I think that sense of, you know, there's not enough time to, to reflect or there's not enough, you know, there's too much, I'm given too much to be able to um, really have that, you know, privilege to be reflecting on this topic. And so I think that's a reality as well. And so even that question of how could we do more, I think can sometimes be overwhelming. Um, and so, you know, to, to recognize all of that um, and to kind of have that honesty with that reality so that we can, you know, hopefully incorporate that into, into a space where we can analyze, um, you know, when that time comes and hopefully that we're able to uh, push for that space to happen. And so to kind of maybe uh, shift over a little bit, we want to, start to bring in uh, a couple tools to make this hopefully a little bit more concrete about, you know, in what ways do we actually, might we actually structure this process of analysis? And so, um, yeah, Charlie, do you wanna uh, just share, share with us a little bit about, you know, the pastoral circle? So we're, we're gonna share a couple of ideas or thoughts that can make this work concrete because Tyga and I aren't with you in your schools. We don't know your context and your realities fully, but, we'd like to provide an overview and enter into and hopefully support your reflection as we're doing here, give you something to think about, but also give you takeaway concrete tools to engage in this work within your context, within your community. And so this first one is the pastoral circle, which maybe some of you are familiar with this, um, but maybe not. Um, it, it's a tool that's that's been widely used kind of within the Catholic Church, but uh, also uh, for those of you who might be familiar with the Jesuit Volunteer Corps, um, you know, Jesuit volunteers are introduced to this as part of their orientation uh, as a way of analyzing their social communities that they enter into. And so, you know, kind of a simple diagram, but, but that first point um, is really that contact or immersion, the experience, you know, that that is actually of encounter. And that really the, the, the fundamental question here is what's happening? Uh, you know, I think for, for those of you who um, are seeing students, you know, on a, on a daily basis, um, you know, to be able to connect to teachers, uh, the, real, the reality of the experience, either of an administrator, um, you know, the leaders or even the teachers or the students or the counselors, um, I think it's important to, to consider who might be bringing this to the higher decision-making spaces um, and I think it really emphasizes, you know, what Pope Francis, um, you know, focal point of encounter. And so, you know, depending on what situation we're analyzing, this might be thought about in, in regards to the engagement that decision makers have to the issues. Uh, it could be thought of as student immersion with social issues. Um, it could be thought about, you know, what school counselors are witnessing in their sessions or the question of how do we know what we know is important here again, you know, in that sense of encounter that person and environment, you know, being brought back forth into our social analysis. That, that second uh, movement, you know, of social analysis to, to kind of then ask ourselves, why is this happening? You know, the, I think uh, there's a series of questions here in that sense of analysis, you know, the, the history of the situation, the structures that are at play, you know, who has power? Power is, I think, a really important thing to analyze. And so, you know, this could be about creating a power map um, it could be about creating correlation diagrams, uh, you know, so as, as one factor goes up, does the other factor go down? Um, or does one go up and the other one goes up? And, and so similarly, if one goes down, the other goes down. So kind of being able to really analyze what is the relationship, you know, between various environments or between various factors. In that third movement, we have the reflection or a theological reflection for, for those um, you know, I think, I think as Jesuit institutions, there might, um, you know, have this sense, uh, a really wealth of, of resources here um, that don't necessarily have to be, you know, theological. It can be from our um, social sciences. It could be from um, theology, but also the Jesuit tradition. And, and I think uh, for those of you who are at the first workshop, you might find that there's a, a wealth of resources from the Jesuit tradition that can inform this. But you know, once we have that sense of relationships between the various environments, I think there's the question, what does it mean? You know, uh, what does this reveal about the values and beliefs behind this relationship? If we're able to kind of see, you know, this is the relationship that's the reality of my environment, 
that um, you know there's real emphasis on these these specific factors, uh, and and that you know accessibility um, to an office with uh, you know is really only going to happen if X, Y, and Z happen. You know, kind of what does that say about the values and beliefs behind um, our environment? And do these align with the values and our mission, our covenant? And so I think really to, to one, pass that social analysis to then move into the reflection. Charlie's just gonna put in uh, within the chat there, you'll see uh, a handout that we um, wanted to provide for you all that'll give a little bit more concrete questions about you know, how to think about some of these steps. But that last, that last um, movement here is, is a response and pastoral planning. So you know, once we kind of have this sense of you know, the movements of what is the reality of the experience? You know, why, why is this happening and what does it mean? That fourth question of how, how should we respond? And I think that this is you know, how what informs our plan for, for that response that, and that's realistic, right? And so, you know, I'm, I'm sure most of you have probably heard of SMART goals, but, um, you know, I like, to, I like to always kind of bring that back into our, our meetings because I think sometimes we can have these, these ideas and goals that, you know, kind of then just get left off the table uh, as, as ideas and goals. And, and so to really kind of bring that back to, you know, SMART goals, being it specific, measurable, attainable, relevant, and time-bound. Um, and so... You know, we'll have that handout to, to have a little bit more guidance on on this pastoral circle. But ultimately, the pastoral pastoral circle is a framework for implementing this, this Jesuit notion of uh, being a you know having contemplation in action. And so, you know, hopefully, this can be uh, one way that you might consider uh, social analysis. The second one is a tool that a, a classmate of mine actually introduced me to, um, but it's not foreign to the Jesuits. Um, we had a, a student here, uh, Sister Natalie Beckhart, uh, a classmate of mine who studied at the School of Theology and Ministry here at Boston College. And she introduced me to this method of communal apostolic discernment. And she's a French religious sister who focuses on this process of synodality. And, and for those of you who might uh, follow the Catholic uh, Church News, uh, February of this year, Pope Francis actually appointed her uh, as the undersecretary of the Synod of Bishops. So that makes her the first woman to have the right to vote in the Catholic Synod of Bishops. So it was really exciting when, when uh, she, she moved over, um, over there. But this process of communal discernment, you know, I think is, is one that is rich in, in our tradition. Um, you know, the first Jesuits practiced the form of this in the process of forming the Society of Jesus. And so anyways, this form of communal apostolic discernment I found can be helpful when working with a group or colleagues um, I think really, you know, when you're searching for a way of proceeding or in search of a shared vision. And so I found that when, um, you know, in this process, uh, we'll also be handing a handout for this as well, but there are three rounds of sharing. So the first round is a, is a personal sharing. Uh, it involves active listening and intentional speaking that everyone's given a space to share from their personal experience, you know, hoping to recognize that we each bring something important to the table. Even if a person feels the same way as another person, they're given that space to share. So really emphasizing that aspect that everyone ought to be heard. And this actually reflects a lot of uh, indigenous communities. Um, they follow a similar procedure with their alcalde or, or village leaders when there's a community issue. And, and I think maybe on a practical level, you know, sometimes the group can be too large for one big sharing session. Um, so in those cases, you know, I've had um, sessions like this where uh, if you're using Zoom, you can use breakout rooms um, to utilize small groups um, and then have someone report out to the large group with a summarized version. The, the second uh, movement here is a reflective sharing. So after some silence or time for reflection, there's a second round of sharing, but this time people are invited to share about what they heard and how they were affected by what they heard. So this might include if, you know, if there were questions about, you know, what were some common themes that you heard or things you didn't expect to hear, but didn't, um, things that you expected to hear, but didn't, or, or maybe even the other way around. So this kind of second round of sharing tends to elicit a space of noticing, noticing the communal movements or the census fidelium, the sense of the faithful, uh, the spirit, 
moving within us and through the community. And then finally, that third movement is discussion. So again, after some silence or time for reflection, there's a third round of sharing where people are invited to name the movements that were happening in the group. And sometimes there's a prompt towards, you know, where do we go from here? And discussion might form a, a shared vision of our way of proceeding. And that, that shared vision is, is what shapes the next steps. It's what shapes the planning phase of that shared, you know, movement about, you know, where are we headed? And, and I think why this process is helpful is because before we talk about planning, I think we really need to talk about a shared vision, you know, that's informed by the members and the leaders of our communities. But I think what's scary about a shared vision is that it's never really my own. And having a shared vision, I think, you know, there's always a risk that what I as an individual think is important may not be the top priority in this communal movement. But, you know, I think the process of a communal apostolic discernment is in hopes that everyone will be heard and seriously taken into consideration in the forming of this shared vision. And whether it be as, as a parish board or as school administrators, or if you want to even just start as a single department, you know, um, I think that this process you know, has been proven helpful, at least for, you know, the Synod of Bishops and, and I think Pope Francis really recognizing um, Sister Natalie for her work in this as well. So to, to maybe, you know, see how we can contextualize it for your specific context. And uh, again, there's another handout to, to hopefully um, inform a little bit more that we can take into your specific groups. And I would just add on to what my colleague has stated is, if you are going to engage in communal discernment, make certain that leadership is comfortable with the group that is engaged in this process, coming up with a decision that will stand. It is tremendously um, undermining to the process and the building of communal uh, discernment or that process if all of a sudden it comes back as simply a recommendation to um, the president or the recommendation to the principal, or if a teacher is implementing a process like this in doing work in their classroom, if the teacher then, the students bring it to the teacher and the teacher's actually, well, I'm gonna decide we're not really gonna do that. So make sure that if you're gonna empower this process, empower it start to finish. And the finish does arrive and needs to arrive at a conclusion. So make certain that decisions are passed to a communal decision process, discernment process that really the group is empowered to make um, would be the one piece I would offer having been engaged in the process before and having that not turn out to be the actual case. Um, and really it challenged everyone that was involved in moving forward with the organization. So can we educate for justice? If we do not educate, uh, individuals for global citizenship, are we educating them for justice? If we do not educate for an understanding of equity and inclusion, are we educating them for justice? We both argue no. Um, we included a quote here from uh, Father Rupe speaking uh, in Spain several years ago now, but he was speaking to a group of um, Jesuit alumni, and he was asking the question, have we educated you for justice? And he asked this rhetorically and answered it, and he said, we know that many Jesuit teachers will answer this question. They will answer with great humility and great sincerity, no, we have not. How do we look past this? How do we as teachers, as educators, as school leaders, look at this idea and say, yes, we will educate for justice. We will educate for equity, for inclusion, for all members of our community, an ever broadening community where more and more are welcome, but all that come into our community have a voice and know that that voice is valued. How will we form global citizens that are committed to these same ideas? This is work that we are called to. This is the covenant that is essential to Jesuit education. So Pope Francis emphasizes that we should not be satisfied with the status quo of our ministries. 
He calls us again to the greater, to the majus, to the more, to that plus, which led Ignatius to begin the processes, to follow them through and to evaluate their real impact on the lives of persons. We want to touch lives. We want to transform individuals through a formation that is deeply tied to a process that Ignatius laid out many years ago. But we want to form individuals that have relationships with God, have deep and meaningful relationships with their fellow man and woman. These are global citizens, and this is our work. With that, we will open up for questions, but please know we are very much cognizant of the time being 814 um, Eastern time, and we are very cognizant of the fact that it is a Thursday uh, at the end of uh, moving towards halfway through a long week, which has been part of a very, very long year and a half for us all. Um, that's me stalling and using my teacher pause, if you will, to see if we do have questions or if folks want to raise their digital hand, we can certainly have you speak um, and your voice will be heard by everyone. And it's just fine that we don't have any questions popping up right now. This work is continuing. Um, Tyga, and I will volunteer him and I'll volunteer myself. If there are questions you'd like to engage in, conversations, discussions you'd like to engage in beyond this, please don't hesitate to reach out. You'll see, we'll get to it in just a minute, um, a slide at the end that offers our emails. You all have also received an email from me um, and I'm happy to share uh, Tyga's as we move forward as well. Um, but I believe you'll see that on the email I sent out today, he was CC'd on it also. Uh, so with that, we do wanna share uh, about a couple of our programs we also have going on that continue to build upon this work, continue to dive into the Jesuit tradition and how it impacts all of us as global-minded educators, educators committed to equity and justice. Great, thanks, Charlie. And, and just to maybe highlight a couple things that um, we we do here at the Institute for Advanced Jesuit Studies. Um, you know, our, our mission at the Institute is really to make, you know, the Jesuit tradition, history, spirituality, and pedagogy accessible. And so, uh, we do have a certificate in Jesuit studies, which is uh, in line with the Masters of Education um, that you can take, you know, receive both at the same time. Uh, part of that, that certificate is to have an immersion course in Spain and Italy, which unfortunately we weren't able to do uh, with the pandemic, but we'll be starting back up next year. Um, and so to really kind of trace the, you know, the footsteps of Ignatius and the first Jesuits, uh, but then also we have a, a new virtual pilgrimage app uh, called Journey with Ignatius. Um, it's a fun little, you know, uh, free app for, uh, you know, iOS and Android. And it's really to, you know, learn about Ignatius, his life, and, um, you know, to pray through this virtual experience of following him, you know, from his first days in Arevalo to, you know, his final days as the superior general in Rome. So. Um, it's kind of neat. It's, it's really new for us, um, but we were incorporating uh, voices from uh, Jesuit high school students, um, Crystal Ray students, um, but also uh, audio examines from different BC faculty and staff. And so, um, you know, we're, we're excited to share it, but we're also, you know, if you're interested in, in, in helping out with us and, and being a part of that app uh, with your students, we, we love that, um, you know, partnership as well. But uh, it's just kind of hopefully a taste of Ignatius's life that um, instills this deeper desire to, to you know, incorporate in, and um, learn more about the Jesuit tradition. Uh, and as Taiga mentioned, you can complete the certificate on your way to uh, a master's uh, in education, our Jesuit education and global world uh, master's. Um, and you can complete it in as little as 18 months, although our first uh, graduate will finish in 12 months. She's been moving very quickly while working full-time at a Jesuit school as well, and she outpaced the rest of her cohort, but she'll finish it in just a year. Um, but we also can spread it out. We have individuals spreading it out over three, three and a half years as well, depending on uh, your own schedule. Uh, and 
VC funds about a third of that. And I know some individuals have schools that have funded part of it uh, and then personally funding part of it. But we want to work with individuals. We also have general financial aid uh, for it. But it's a 30 credit master's focused on um, Ignatian education, Jesuit education. And so um, it's something we're really excited, uh, something my colleague uh, Christi Cristiano Castellini and I developed and we're really excited and to be able to do it in collaboration with our Institute for Advanced Jesuit Studies is simply a gift and an ability for us to utilize a number of our strengths we have here at Boston College in hopes of supporting all Jesuit educators um, domestically and globally. Uh, uh, GRE is not required. They like me to mention that to people uh, so they can feel like it's a very quick and easy process and we're happy to work work with you through that process. Uh, with that, uh, we wanna say thank you. Again, our emails are here. If there's anything you need, uh, if you have questions about uh, the graduate degree, that's there as well, our grad studies office. Uh, but with that, thank you for being with us here this evening. Uh, we look forward to you uh, joining our colleague uh, in just less than a six, uh, uh, just a less than a week, six days from now, uh, Muki Manalili. Um, and he'll be uh, focusing in on self-care and utilization of uh, Ignatian tools, Jesuit tools to help care for um, yourself, your students and your community. So we would really encourage you to also uh, join us next Tuesday with Muki. Um, I, I guarantee uh, it'll be fantastic. Uh, I know I'll be here on with him because I learn every time I'm with him, but thank you to all of you. Uh, have a great evening and we wish you the best. God bless.